Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 170, which reads as follows. Yatha pumbula kang pase, yatha pase marichi kang, ewang lo kang awe kantang, matura jana pasati. Which means, as one would look at a bubble, as one would look at a mirage, one who looks at the world in this way, the king of death never sees, doesn't see. So, here we have a short but sweet story. I think it's quite useful for instructive purposes. There's a good there's a good message here. Especially for meditators. This is a story about uh, five hundred vipassake bhikkhu bhikkhu. So vipassake bhikkhu monks who saw clearly, who were practicing to see clearly. Vipassana, right? Vipassake. Now 500, I'm not sure if I would take that literally. There's been some talk about how you should see 500 as just meaning a lot, a large group. Um, and this was a large group of monks who obtained meditation subject from the Buddha. He taught them how to meditate, probably uh, probably some sort of combination of samatha meditation, vipassana meditation, teaching them how to calm their minds and how to clear their minds, clean, cleanse their minds. Right? And uh, they went to the forest and they practiced meditation, devoted themselves to it, but they couldn't gain any attainment. They practiced for quite some time, and they thought, well, you know, this we gained this all this knowledge from the Buddha. You know, we gained all these meditation subjects or whatever subject they gained, and they thought it's just not working. Let's go back to the Buddha and tell them it didn't work. That he needs to give us a new meditation subject. Now on the way back they came upon a mirage, which I'm not sure, I've never seen a mirage, but I imagine it's something that you'd see in a desert, right? In the movies you see. Um, some sort of mirage. The text actually doesn't, doesn't elaborate on what sort of a mirage they saw. But it is possible that you see, now that you saw them when you're... Uh, Normally you'd see them when you're dying or, or when you're dying of thirst and then suddenly the delusion. Meditators see mirages in the middle of the night, right? You look at the floor and you see all sorts of crazy things. And you're practicing all night sometimes and you see things in the wooden floors and it can get kind of crazy. Um, but I suppose in nature there is possible for them to see something. Hey, doesn't that look like maybe a windstorm and it looks like something, or a cloud. You see clouds that look like bunny rabbits and so on. Not really important. Somehow they saw a mirage. Um, and and this picture, this, this looking at the mirage, they, they, they found themselves entranced by it. I mean, it must have been something very strange in nature that they found themselves transfixed by it. And uh, they, pra they they focused on it, just standing it, standing there or walking or whatever, maybe standing by the side of the road. They saw this mirage and they just stared at it for a while and it really calmed their minds down. And it calmed their minds to such an extent that they they had this image in their minds the whole way home, I guess, and and they were able to become very focused in their minds. Uh, and then they, they got back to the monastery, and as soon as they got back to the monastery, it started raining. And so they all...
quickly walked under, to, under some cover and they stood there watching the rain. And they watched as the rain would uh, hit the ground and, and, and explode. The raindrops would explode. There would be the splattering of rain, right? And again, with this, with this quieted mind, this calm mind, they watched this uh, incessant um, bursting of rain, of rain, uh, of raindrops, and it somehow resonated with them. And again, this time, it didn't calm them down. It kind of agitated them, and they started to sit to feel like this is what life is this is what life is like this incessant um, experience of well and everything everything that we experience our, our self and the world around us it's just this arising and ceasing and and so because it was so uh, such a strong rain uh, it was such a violent uh, experience that it really, it really resonated this with them, this this arising and ceasing. And so that's where this story comes from. And the Buddha then uh, came and told them this verse, taught them this verse. And so we have to unpack what's going on here. Uh, if you look at the two experiences, it's setting up two specific types of meditation. They saw something interesting on their way home. And it, it, it attracted their attention, and they were able to use it as an object of tranquility meditation. It calmed their minds down. The raindrops were another experience of nature that, you know, rain, there's no one object that you can fix on. And so rather than attaining uh, tranquility by focusing on it, this poof, 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 constant burst of, of uh, experience, they were able to. It was. They were able to make it resonate with their own experience of everything arising and ceasing. All of their experiences, and so gain insight from it, or or use it as a catalyst to help them focus their minds on on gaining insight. And when the Buddha comes and tells them the verse, uh, it seems to be uh, capitalizing on their state of mind, certainly, but also taking what's in their experience and applying it. So um, re or shifting their focus and realigning their, shifting their attention to what is really important. So let's go through what's really important. Um, I think the first, the, 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 an important lesson that comes from the story itself is that First of all, don't be discouraged when your meditation doesn't bear fruit um, because the, the work that you do in cultivating mindfulness and, and all the good faculties, confidence, effort, concentration, wisdom, and most importantly, mindfulness, the work that you do in cultivating this isn't lost. Uh, I, talk, I talk often about not being discouraged or concerned with results, but ask yourself whether your quality of mind is wholesome. And the further you get in meditation, the more clear that will be as a, as a source of confidence and inspiration. Uh, in the beginning you want results, you need some sign that it's working, but a sign of progress is to stop looking for results and start looking at now. Your, being able to uh, have complete conviction about what states of mind are wholesome and what states of mind are unwholesome, which are good for you and which are bad for you, and to be clear of, to be clear when your mind is in a good state. And so, the cultivation of of this goodness will bring results. These monks got discouraged, and you might say they got discouraged too early because they were ripe for insight and tranquility on their way home, so all it took was some specific experiences, and it uh, it awakened. I wouldn't say, you wouldn't want to read this as all that time was a waste, and then 
All they should have done is just walk back and forth on this road until they saw these specific things. No, their minds were primed for this through all the practice they had done. And you find this can be the case. You go home and when you least expect it, some insight arises or even attainment of cessation. People can attain Nibbāna in doing anything. You know, but not uh, because of how, how their mind was at that moment, but because of how much work they had done. It builds up, it, it gathers up, it, it doesn't go away, it doesn't disappear. Uh, and, and, but the second, and the second lesson, I think, is that um, you shouldn't, we shouldn't disparage uh, ordinary experience as an object of meditation. I guess it's really an extension of that, is that um, you know, watching ordinary things is, uh, is often or sometimes better than watching a, a, f uh, a formal technique, a formal object in a technique, because it may resonate with you more because it's more natural. If you can become mindful in your daily life, it can often be more powerful because it changes something very deep in your heart. You know, if you come here and practice meditation, this is very far removed from that side of your life uh, that you've that you're familiar with for so many years. And so it can lead to this sort of split personality where you're one way in the meditation center, but you go home and you're another way. If you manage to be mindful in your daily life, that that's no longer the case. You're able to change the very core of your personality. So, so natural experiences like this that were familiar to these monks uh, actually may have been you know, very important or seem to have been very important in their attainment of enlightenment. I think that's about it for the story. For the for the verse, I mean, the other thing that we can notice is that there's. I may have mentioned there's a there's clear distinction between samatha meditation and insight meditation. But the verse, I think, uh, is much more focused on insight meditation. So it takes these two... In the, in the story, the mirage was used to cultivate insight, uh, tranquility meditation. The bubbles, of, well, they're not really bubbles, but the raindrops, were used to cultivate insight. But in the verse, he talks about the world being like a bubble and the world being like a mirage. This is how one should see the world. And this highlights two important aspects of insight meditation. A bubble, a bubble is something, actually, let's put a mirage first. I think the commentary does that as well. Yeah, so let's look at the mirage first. A mirage a mirage is something that's not real. When you look at a cloud and you see a bunny rabbit, there's no bunny rabbit there, right? And you might say, well, who, who, who's to say there is no bunny rabbit, right? Well, I think if you went close to the cloud, if you investigated everything about the cloud, we're all pretty clear that many characteristics of bunny rabbits would be missing. You wouldn't be able to feed it celery or... You wouldn't be able to pet it and feel its fur. It wouldn't have to get pregnant and have other baby rabbits and so on. The idea that there's a ba there's a bunny rabbit there is an illusion. That's what a mirage is. So there is some sense that you're more right to say there is no bunny rabbit. There is no mirage. And this, and and that's important because if you base it on if you base your reality on, say, there's a... In, in India, they thought the image of the moon was of a bunny rabbit as well. So they talk about in the old texts about a bunny rabbit, a rabbit in the moon. Uh, but if you base your life on it, there's going to be consequences. Not very far-reaching ones, but to believe there actually is a bunny in the moon is going to distort your perception of reality if to a fairly minimal level. But it gets more important when you have illusions about important things, right? 
if you have an illusion that everyone uh, respects you and looks up to you, but in fact they just fear you, or maybe they're disgusted by you, if you think, like some men think all the women find them attractive, or some women think all the men find them attractive, I mean, this becomes more important. These illusions that we have are the way we perceive things uh, becomes very important. Uh, and on the deepest level, our, our relationship with concepts as a whole is the most important sort of a part of, of this concept of, of illusion. Because a concept is an illusion in some sense. And, and by concept, let's understand what we mean by concept. A concept is the concept of a microphone, or the concept of a, um, a, a carpet, a concept of a person. It's a concept because it only exists in the minds of the people who think of it, in the minds of sentient beings. A person doesn't exist uh, in ultimate reality. You know, if you take apart a car, you don't find anything, you don't find a car in, in there. If you take apart a human being, you don't find human beings. And so, to some extent, concepts, uh, an entity, a thing, all things, well, most things, uh, are, are just illusions. They're just like a mirage. And why this is the most important, why this gets important is because the way that entities work, because they're based entirely on our mental perception of them, is that they are then subject to and distorted by our minds. So all the people around us, our family, let's say, we think of our family in a certain way and we become fond of them and we have the idea that they're going to make us happy and we have expectations about them, we have uh, uh, narratives about them, our 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 loved ones, our uh, romantic partner. I think a romantic partner is the most, is one of the clearest because you have conceptions about who they are based on, on, on this entity that you've created. But in fact, what are they? They are a mass bundle of confused, often uh, convoluted, messed up habits that they've developed, that have developed over, li over their lives. And so a big reason why we're disappointed in, in our family and our friends and our lovers and, and so on is because we had a, a view of what they were and, and that view was shattered or that view, the, the ex reality did not align with that view. This is a way of describing death. When a person dies, well, your idea of them is as alive. And so reality is not as you want it to be. And we're constantly out of sync with reality as a result of our um, our living in a world of concepts. You can see this as a meditator. When you practice meditation, this changes. And you look at people and, and you have a, a, an understanding based on your own experience of what they are, that this is just a, a, a complex organism, a system of experiences. And so you have very little expectations because you're clear that you don't know what's going to come next. You're much clearer that things are much more complicated than just saying, oh, this is so-and-so and they're this sort of person, they're like this, like that. You, you start to see at least that things are very complicated.
you, so you see the, the distinction between concepts and reality. A person who studies reality is able to see things, experiences arising and ceasing, and is able to see that the world is, or the, the world of entities is just a mirage. The other side of it is the bubble side, and this is the arising and ceasing. He says one should look at the world as, as a bubble. Bubbles are things that arise and cease. The, the, the imagery of a bubble is to give you the sense of something that pops, something that is, just disappears. Where did the bubble go? It's just gone. And this is a, you know, the other side of the uh, this idea of, of the problem with concepts, because experiences are, are chaotic, impermanent. And concepts are not. The concepts of, I have concepts of people who have died, I have concepts of my grandparents. I can conceive of them in my mind and, and think of them, but that person is only exists in our minds, the minds of the people who knew them. The reality, a reality, who knows where they are. Certainly their body is never, is totally gone. Um, I was away in Asia for a long time, and when I, came, when I came back, my parents, they had all gotten older. And my parents, my family, they had all, all changed. You know, someone you haven't seen in a while, it really can shake you up, you know, it can shock you, surprise you, when you see how much they've changed, how much I had changed. If you, when you go home as a meditator, sometimes you find your family is quite shocked. It feels like you're a new person, and they, they sometimes mourn the loss of the person they loved, because they were clinging to that. I mean, these are just simple examples, but this goes on incessantly throughout our day, not to mention our lives. We're constantly surprised and, and uh, taken off guard by experience, because we're, our focus isn't there. Our focus say, during a day is on um, let's say the meal. So we have, okay, here's our meal, and this is set out, and I have, good, I got um, some soup, or I got some salad, or some rice, or whatever. But then you take a bite, and it's not how you expect it, and there's uh, disappointment, or it's too cold when you want it to be hot. And when we're dwelling in, in concepts, I see our mind is preoccupied. When we dwell in reality, when we're with this, this experience moment by moment, when we learn, when we, when we become familiar with this, then this idea of being surprised and, and upset is just totally foreign. It has no place. Our relationship with reality is it arises and ceases. It comes and goes moment by moment. It's important to understand that reality is quite simple in that way. And our relationship with reality does never, never has to be one of fixing, changing, and certainly not getting upset or reacting to it. Our relationship should be seeing that it comes and goes. Comes and goes like a bubble. And the second part of the verse, if one does this, looks upon the world in this way, the king of death will not see them. So what does this mean, the king of death not, won't see them? It's an interesting phrase. What it means is they won't die, obviously. Um, but it's interesting because, well, they will die. <laughs> Everyone dies. Even, the enlight even enlightened beings die. But I, w but I think... There's some sense where they wouldn't want to call it death, where they would have said, no, no, an enlightened person, what they go through isn't death. I've heard monks say this sort of thing. And I think the reasoning is this, because death is, an, is defined by the, the process of going from this um, existence into another existence. It's that transfer. Um, you know, it's not how I would define death, but... If you talk about death as being the breakup of the, of the body, when the body stops working, that's death. But that's why they call there are, there are 
um, what they call near-death experiences are actually after death. The body dies and someone has these experiences, but then the body is revived, so it comes back to life. And they can relate those experiences that they had when they were dead. Um, but what it really means, I mean, this isn't a big point, but if you just want to understand this, what it really means is that they won't die again. When, uh, when it, you know, a person who, who death will pass over and will never see, this is because they're not born again. If you're not born, you can't die. What it means is that they'll become free from suffering. What's really important about this is that they won't, like everyone else, have to come back and do this again and again and again, right? Most people would be excited at the idea of having to come back, but then do this, and, and oh, I, I can you know, do, live another life, and isn't that interesting? But in fact, the problem is that we've been doing this again and again, and this is all we've come up with. And if you look back on your life, I think most people would admit that it wasn't all rainbows and, and flowers. It's it's uh, there's a lot of trouble, and to do this again and again and again, that's what it means. One would be free from suffering because they're not born again. Anyway is it's a good thing. You see the world in this way, things get better, not worse. Happiness comes, peace comes. Lots of good things come. So in the end, you never focus on happiness, always focus on goodness and, and an ultimate, uh, ultimately wisdom, this kind of wisdom, the wisdom of seeing that everything that we look at in the world is just concepts, people, places, things. It's a different world from what's actually going on underneath, in the background. And if we focus and come to see uh, the, this background activity, which is what's really going on in our experience as we're caught up in concept, if we see it as just arising and ceasing, uh, there's nothing else and there's no, there's no hook that can keep us tied down. There's such a power and a freedom and a safety. You're, you're, you're immune to any danger. This is what true freedom from suffering is. So, that's the Dhammapada verse for tonight. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>